Section 5 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding Barons and Knights in the Great Charter by J. H. Round, LLD, Part 2 that baronies were liable to arbitrary relief is admitted on all hands but in order to ascertain the sums exacted under henry the second it is not enough to copy the extracts made by maddox one has to examine the pipe rolls for oneself and even then evidence may be missed for the phrase finis terre is only indexed in some of the printed volumes of pipe rolls though relevium is indexed regularly it is for the former that we have in the case of baronies to look it would be necessary therefore to read through the whole of the volumes in order to make one's list exhaustive the table on the opposite page however will illustrate the nature of the sums paid under henry the second eleven fifty six robert de halion fees ten query one hundred marks eleven fifty eight william Paynell fees fifteen query one hundred marks eleven sixty five roger doyley two hundred marks eleven sixty six helia skiffard one hundred pounds alan de ferno one hundred marks walter brito fees fifteen two hundred pounds eleven sixty seven humphrey de bohun two hundred pounds richard de sifrawast one hundred marks eleven sixty eight john dyancourt fees forty one hundred marks william de scalariis fees fifteen query one hundred pounds eleven seventy one william fossard fees thirty three and a half eighty marks eleven seventy six john the constable of chester four hundred marks william de montacute fees ten query one hundred marks eleven seventy seven william chendituit two hundred marks eleven seventy eight robert de lacy one thousand marks eleven eighty hasculf de tanny fees seven and a half one hundred pounds eleven eighty one hugh de gournay one hundred pounds eleven eighty two nicholas de merrier fees two and a half twenty pounds eleven eighty three guy de rochford forty marks eleven eighty six hamo fitz mainfelin fees fifteen two hundred marks barony of eton hastings fees five two hundred marks hugh de say fees fifteen query two hundred pounds richard fitz john two hundred marks the first point to strike one here is that most of these sums are either two hundred pounds or one hundred pounds two hundred marks or one hundred marks this is an unexpected result the more so as no relation can be traced between the size of the barony and the relief exacted moreover of these four sums only two exceed the maximum fixed by the charter while one is actually below it this emphasizes the contrast between the arbitrary fine from a barony and the fixed sum of a hundred shillings due from a knight's fee when we confine our attention to the figures for a single county the contrast we shall find becomes striking the evidence for northumberland is of peculiar value for more reasons than one in the first place the proportion of single fees held in chief is exceptionally large and in the second we have copious information on the constituents of the holdings together with notable evidence on the use of the word barony let us first take a typical five-night barony that of the bertrams of mitford 
Footnote, there was another Bertram barony in the county, that of the Bertrams of Bothell, three knights. End footnote. In 1166, Roger Bertram certified that it was held by the service of five knights. Footnote, et sciatis domine quod feodum meum non debet wobi servitium nisi tantum de quinque militibus. Red Book. End footnote. In 1177, his successor, William Bertram, was called upon to pay pro fine terre patri sui no less than £200. In 1212, another Roger Bertram is returned as holding the barony by the service of five knights. Footnote, Rogerus Bertram tenet in capite de domino rege baroniam, sic de midford per servicium quinque militum. Testa, page 392. Rogerus Bertram Baroniam, Sic de Mitford, Per Quinque Feoda, Red Book, page 563. Baronia de Mitford, Testa, page 383. End footnote. Here, then, is a clear case of an undoubted barony, by no means a large one as baronies went, charged exactly twice the amount prescribed in the Great Charter, as the rightful and ancient, antiquum, relief. We have thus a striking illustration of the fact that, as I have insisted, the feudal extortions remedied by the Charter were not, as is so often implied, introduced by John, but are found in full existence under Henry the Second. Footnote, e.g. McKechnie Magna Carta, 1914, pages 196-198. So also Petit du Tailly, Studies Supplementary to Stubbs Constitutional History, 1908, page 129, quote, Its most salient characteristic is the restoration of the old feudal law violated by John Lackland, and perhaps its practically most important clauses, because they could be really applied, were that, for example, which limited the right of relief, end quote. Also, History of English Law, 1895, page 151, quote, John in these last years has been breaking the law, therefore the law must be defined and set in writing. End, quote. End footnote. Again, we observe that the sum exacted is rightly styled finis terre, not relevium, for it represented, as the Dialogus and Glanville's book explain, a special commutation of the king's right to exact, in the case of a barony, an arbitrary sum. From this Northumberland barony we will pass to a smaller one, the story of which is more complicated and has to be reconstructed. In 1163, William de Granville was holding what we learn from evidence of three years later was a barony held by the service of three knights. Next year it had passed to two co-heiresses, of whom Ralph de Gogy married the elder and Hugh de Ellington, i.e. Ellington, the younger. This we learn from the same evidence, namely from their respective returns in 1166. The pipe roll of 1164 shows each of them paying a sum pro relevio terre sue. Footnote, pipe roll, 8th regnal year of Henry II, page 11. The fact is obscured by Hugh's name being there printed as de Clenton. End footnote. Ralph pays 40 marks and Hugh 20, so that the whole relief exacted was 60 marks, 40 pounds, though the service due from the barony was only that of three knights. Hugh, however, admitted that his tenure was baronial, and the entire holding appears in 1212 as a baronia in the hands of Ralph de Gogy. Footnote, Ego teneo dimidiam baroniam. See for its constituents, Tester, pages 382-392. Compare with this dimidia baronia, the baronia integra of the Great Charter, and observe that the baronial tenure is not affected by subdivision, though Ralph and Hugh each claim to owe the service of, quote, a knight and a half, end quote, 
only. End footnote. This exposed it to an arbitrary relief, as the payment is in this case termed, in 1164, namely forty pounds, in lieu of the fifteen pounds which would have been payable if the holding had not been a barony but three knights' fees. Let us now compare with these baronies three or four Northumberland holdings, the returns for which were similarly made among the Cartae Baronum in 1166. For these were similarly held in chief, though each of them owed the service of one knight at most. William, son of Seawood, who made return in 1166 that he held a knight's fee by the service of one knight, is proved by his tenure of Gosforth to be a Surtees, and therefore identical with the William de Teza, or Tesia, of 1161 to 1162. In 1174, his successor, Randolph de Super Tese, was charged 100 shillings, five pounds, de relevio suo. This was the fixed relief on a knight's fee. The next case is that of Ernulf de Morwick, who returned his holding in 1166 as a knight's fee, quote, of the old fiefment, end quote. In 1177, his successor, Hugh de Morwick, was charged a hundred shillings, five pounds, for his relief. This Hugh appears as one of Henry's ministerial officers towards the end of the reign, and it is interesting to note that so early as 1161 he has a discharge, precepto cancellarii, of two marks charged to his father, which suggests that he was already in official employment. The third case is that of Robert Caro, who returned himself in 1166 as holding five cariucates as one knight's fee. In 1179, Peter Carhu accounted for 100 shillings for his relief. Even more notable is the case of Godfrey Bayar, who returned his holding in 1166 as one third of a fee and who had been charged the year before thirty-three shillings four pence, that is, just a third of the regulation five pounds. The importance of this evidence is that in each of three cases where the holding was one fee or less, and where the holding was not part of an escheated honour, relief was uniformly charged at the rate of five pounds a fee. On the other hand, a three-fee barony was charged, we have seen, forty pounds, and a five-fee barony, two hundred pounds. Moreover, in 1168, an entry on the pipe roll runs, quote, Idem vice comes redit compotum de feodis baronum et militum, qui de rege tenent in capite in balia sua, qui cartas de tenemento suo regi non miserunt. End quote. The sheriff was here dealing, as I was above, not with holdings on escheated honours, but with those which were held in capite ut de corona. If we now pass to the other end of England, we find in Devon Geoffrey del Estre paying five pounds in 1183 as the relief on a knight's fee. There is nothing by which he can be identified in the Cartae of 1166, but an analysis of the scutage returns shows that the Robertus Filius Galfridi of 1166, Red Book, page 258, must have been Robert, son of Geoffrey de Lestre, and father of Geoffrey, who succeeded in 1183. Again, turning from Devon to Norfolk, we find William de Colechurch, returning his small tenement as held by the service of half a knight. His son Richard, on succeeding him, paid for his relief fifty shillings, the sum due on half a fee. In these two cases, we can clearly identify the holdings among those held in capite in 1166. It has, at least, now been clearly established that those who made their returns in 1166, although then treated apparently as being all on the same footing, were not treated alike in the matter of their reliefs. Those who held, in the cases examined, one fee or less, were only called upon to pay at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee. 
are we then to infer that the distinction between the two reliefs was that if a man held a single fee or less he paid five pounds or less pro rata while if he held more he was liable to a relief of one hundred pounds as holding by barony it would seem that such a proposition need only be stated to be rejected as absurd there is however a remarkable case discussed in the reports on the dignity of a peer and known to us from a petition to parliament in thirteen fifty four the twenty eighth regnal year of edward the third which certainly seems to show that at this date that proposition was the law Quote, in the parliament of the twenty eighth of the king robert de la mer suggested that after the death of peter de la mer his father he had atoned to the king and done homage for a moiety of the manor of lavington for which moiety he came into the exchequer and acknowledged his tenure that he held the moiety of the said manor by the service of one knight's fee and for that fee had paid one hundred shillings for his relief nevertheless for that in the red book of the exchequer it was found that henry the second to marry his daughter to the duke of saxony demanded of every knight of his kingdom a mark in aid of that marriage and commanded that every prelate and baron should certify to the said king in writing how many knights he held of the king in chief among which prelates and barons one peter de mara had certified that he held lavington by two knights fees the barons of the exchequer insisted that peter de mara was ancestor of the petitioner and that the petitioner held by barony and for service of barony they charged him of his said relief where he held only the moiety of the manor by the service of one knight's fee only and he prayed a writ to the said treasurer and barons that if they could not find by inquest or otherwise that the said entire manor was held by greater service than two fees and that there is another tenant of the other moiety of the manor that then they would accept his relief for one fee only notwithstanding the things found in the red book mentioned a writ was accordingly ordered to the treasurer and barons of the exchequer that if they should find by record or other remembrances of the exchequer or by inquest or in any other proper manner that the petitioner held the moiety of the manor by the service of one knight's fee as supposed by the petition and not by barony that then having received from him selon la ferron of one fee for his relief they should discharge him of the remainder notwithstanding the name of the said peter was found in the red book amongst the names of the barons it seems from this entry that in the reign of edward the third holding by barony and holding by knight's service only were so far considered as distinct that if a man held by the service of a knight's fee he was subject only to a relief of one hundred shillings and if he held by barony he was chargeable with one hundred marks for his relief though his barony consisted only of two knights fees the entry shows also that the red book of the exchequer was then considered as a document of such degree of authority in the court of exchequer that the court had acted upon it the whole proceeding however seems to show that a writ of summons to parliament did not then necessarily follow tenure by barony the committee not having found any person of the name of mara at any time summoned to parliament not having discovered what was done on the reference of this petition to the exchequer they are unable to give any further information on the subject End quote volume one pages three to five to six from rotuli parliamentarii edward the third page two six three as this is an unsatisfactory comment on the case it seems desirable to state the facts in eleven sixty six peter de la mer returned himself under wiltshire as holding steeple or market lavington by the service of two knights footnote habeo lawentonum westri gratia in dominio pro servitio duorum militum red book page two four six end footnote he was succeeded by robert and robert by peter de la mer 
who paid scutage on two fees. A notable entry in the Wiltshire Inquisition of 1212, query, records the, quote, Baronia seek Roberti de la Mare, duo feoda, though in what is printed as the same list we find Galfridus filius Petri unum feodum in lawintone, Robertus de la Mare unum feodum in lawintone. In any case, the manor came to be held in two moieties some years later, for William de la Rocal sued Peter de Mare for it in the fifth regnal year of Henry III, 1220 to 1221, and must have obtained a moiety of it, as we learn from the tester, the evidence of which is confirmed by the hundred rolls. Footnote, the entries on page 151a are decisive, confer page 141b, where Peter de la Mare's holding is given as one fee. End footnote. The Inquisitiones post mortem bear similar witness. That on Peter de la Mare gives the holding as one fee, and so does that on a later Peter de la Mare in 1292, though that on Robert de la Mare in the second regnal year of Edward II records it as half a fee. It is clear, therefore, that Peter de la Mare, as he claimed in his petition, did not owe the service of more than one knight, and therefore, by the admission of the crown, he was only liable to a relief of five pounds, and not to that of one hundred pounds which would have been due from a barony. On the other hand, there is a decided case of earlier date, 1306 to 1307, which points in quite a different direction for the legal interpretation at its date of the clause about reliefs. William de Briouze, Braussa, son of William, raised a question as to the relief due from him for the castle of Bramber, Sussex, and the land of Guha, i.e. Gower, the South Wales Peninsula. He boldly claimed that in the host, Bramber had only returned the service of one knight. Footnote, Wilhelmus et antecessore sui defenderunt castrum et terram de Brembre pro servicio unius feodi militis. End footnote. The barons of the exchequer decided the question, one, by reference to the book of fees, two, by evidence that William and his predecessors had always been immersed as barons without protest. They found that, quote, in libro feodorum brembre repertum est subtitulo de honoribus end quote. and that quote, tantum debere solvi pro relevio de honore quantum pro relevio baroniae end quote. the reference to the book of fees must apparently be to the testa de neville page two 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 a where the tenants of knights fees de brembre are all entered as holding de eodem honore but it is difficult to understand why these entries should be chosen when on page two two three the same list is headed quote, isti tenant de baronia de brembre johannes le cunte tenet quatuor feoda de eardem baronia End quote. moreover on page two two six b we read quote, in rapo de brembre Wilhelmus de Breuse et antecessores eus tenuerunt rapum de Brembre in capite de domino rege et antecessoribus eus ex conquestu Angliae per servicium decem militum. End quote. The barons decided quite rightly that William should be charged relief for Bramber as for a barony. Footnote. Honoretur de relevio suo de castro praedicto, tanquam de relevio baroniae. The whole proceedings are printed in Maddox Exchequer, 1711, pages 372 to 4, from the plea rolls. See also Baronia Anglica, page 39. End footnote. But far more important for our purpose is their decision as to Gower. William pleaded, Dicta terra de guha, tenetur de rege in capite, per servicium unius feodi militis, de dono et fiofermento regis Johannis. 
in proof thereof he produced a charter of john twenty fourth of february twelve o two to twelve o three the fourth regnal year of john granting to his predecessor william de braosa the whole land terra of guha with all its appurtenances in wales Quote, per servicium unius militis pro omni servicio End quote. this was accepted by the barons as proof that he held guha pro uno feodo militis and he was accordingly charged only the five pounds relief quote, pro terra de guha in walia quae tenetur de rege in capite per servicium unius feodi militis End quote. In this case, the barons seem to have deemed the documentary evidence decisive. We must therefore conclude that in all the cases in which such evidence could be produced, the tenure was admitted to be knight's fee, not barony. Now this class of knights, those who were enfeoffed by charter, must have formed a fairly numerous body, who could all claim that they did not hold by barony, and were therefore not liable to the relief due from a baron, i.e. the holder of a barony. It was the custom under Richard and John, and even under Henry the Second, to grant considerable estates as single knight's fees, as we learn from the entries in the Red Book of holdings created subsequent to 1166. Footnote this charter is printed by Maddox among the proceedings, ut supra, and also in Calendar of Charter Rolls, 1908, 3, 46. End footnote. The existence of this class of holdings seems to have been overlooked by those who have discussed the subject. The only point that remains doubtful is whether holdings so created as knights' fees, but owing the service of more than one knight, were called upon to pay relief as baronies or not. In the case of those who held by the service of a single knight, there would seem to have been no question. Some support for the view that a line was drawn, as in the case of the de la Mer holding cited above, between those who held by the service of more than one knight and those who only held a single fee or less, is afforded by the returns of 1236, in which the sheriffs are directed to make separate returns of these two classes. Perhaps the most remarkable return for its bearing on Chapter 2 in the Great Charter is that made by the Sheriff of Shropshire in 1212. In this return, the first entry relates to William Fitz Allen, who is described as holding in capite de domino rege per baroniam. The second states that Roger Mortimer baro tenet in capite de domino rege. The third and fourth show us Walter de Lacy and Robert Mortimer holding similiter. In the next five entries each holder baro similiter tenet. In the tenth, William Botrealus baro tenuit in capite de domino rege per servicium dimidii militis, which was also the service of Peter Fitzherbert, the last but one in the first portion of the list. Then come six entries, in the first four of which we have the formula miles tenet in capite de domino rege, while in the fifth and sixth the word miles is omitted, though in the sixth the service is that of one knight. This list suggests several considerations. In the first place, it obviously identifies Barrow with the man who holds Per Baroniam. In the second, it names the ten Barones first and the six Milites after them. In the next, we find two Barones who hold only half a fee apiece, in Shropshire at least. Certainly we have here a list that seems to have unique importance as bearing on the barons and knights of the Great Charter three years later. It is, however, unfortunate that Shropshire was a county which had only come into the hands of the crown on the downfall of its earl's house early in the reign of Henry I. If their fief was deemed to constitute an escheated honour, 
the status of their tenants after the forfeiture might be that of those who held in capite ut de honore this question arose in twelve twenty five only ten years after the great charter hugh pantulf appears in our list as a barrow holding in capite whose service was that of five knights his son william was charged one hundred pounds for his relief as for a barony but he protested before the king quod non tenet de rege in capite nisi feoda quinque militum de terra quae fuit roberti de belesme his contention was allowed and his payment reduced from one hundred pounds to twenty five pounds on the other hand robert corbett the subject of the next entry who similarly held as a barrow five knights fees contended in twelve fifty to twelve fifty one that none of his predecessors had paid relief on them but was made to pay the baronial fine of one hundred pounds on his barony of cows this singular contrast affords a further illustration of the difficulties and confusion by which this subject is surrounded even so far back as the seventeenth century dugdale acutely observed that hugh de morwick had the reputation of a baron but his barony consisted of no more than that one knight's fee by which service he held the manor of chivington his holding is carefully distinguished as a villa not a baronia in tester page three nine two b but is styled the baronia hugonis de morwick on page three eighty two b though the said manor is there entered as held per feodum unius militis in spite however of much confusion and contradiction on the subject it is clear that the great charter by drawing the line it did between the relief due from a barony and that which was due from a knight's fee must have led to a definite distinction between the two kinds of tenure in spite however of much confusion and contradiction on the subject it is clear that the great charter by drawing the line it did between the relief due from a barony and that which was due from a knight's fee must have led to a definite distinction between the two kinds of tenure and the ever-increasing subdivision of baronies must have accentuated that distinction we have seen that even under henry the second the two moieties of a barony of only three knights fees were each of them called upon to pay relief on a higher scale than that of the five pounds due from a knight's fee because the tenure was baronial whether this arrangement favoured the tenant or the crown depended on the number of knights due so witium debitum from the barony for instance in twelve thirty six to twelve thirty seven the barony of d'aubigny de albigny of canehoe was divided between three co-heirs each of whom was called upon to pay fifty marks the third of that hundred pounds which was due from the baronia integra as the service due from the barony was twenty-five knights each third was reckoned at eight and a third fees on which the baronial relief was thirty-three pounds six shillings and eightpence though at five pounds on the knight's fee the sum payable would have been forty-one pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence sixty-two and a half marks similarly the essex barony of montfiche was divided into three portions one of which fell to richard de play who was charged fifty marks ut pro tercia parte baroniae baronia integra tunc temporis onerata fuit versus regem de relevio suo de centum libra again in the twenty-first regnal year of edward i alice de musgro had paid twenty-five marks for the sixth part of a barony but her heir in the thirty-fifth regnal year of edward i was only charged eleven pounds two shillings two and a half pence for the same two-thirds of the amount because the relief on a barony had been reduced in the interval from one hundred pounds to one hundred marks eventually the complications caused by these tenures became very great in the eighteenth regnal year of richard the second thirteen ninety four to thirteen ninety five 
Robert de Todenham admitted that he held certain property by the service of the third part of the eighteenth part, i.e. the fifty-fourth part, of the barony of Beecham of Bedford, and part of an advowson by the service of the seventh part of the third part of the said barony, together with a Suffolk manor, which he held in capite ut de honore boloniae by the service of two knights for this last tenure he paid ten pounds but only small fractional sums for his two baronial tenures no wonder that maddox summed up his evidence as proving that quote, land baronies were divided and subdivided till at length they were brought to naught end quote at last we are in a position to arrive at some conclusions with regard to the difficult problem dealt with in this paper as i observed just above it depended on the service due from a barony whether it was in the tenant's interest to claim that his tenure was baronial or that of knight's fees so conversely with the crown when the baronial relief stood at a hundred pounds it was in the interest of the holder or holders of a barony owing the service of more than twenty fees to claim that what they had to pay was the baronial relief when that relief was reduced to a hundred marks the above statement would hold true of baronies or portions of baronies owing the service of thirteen and a third knights or more on the other hand the holders of small baronies would naturally try to pay relief at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee in each case the interests of the crown were of course opposed to theirs and thus there would often arise the question whether the tenure was barony or knight's fee as to one class of knights there seems to have been no difficulty those who held of an escheated honour would always pay relief at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee however many fees they might hold the great charter provided for their case in its forty-third chapter but as to tenants per sir Whittium militare who held in capite ut de corona questions would arise perhaps we may divide them into two classes one those who could produce a charter of enfeoffment from the crown two those whose tenure was prescriptive if a man could produce such a charter in fiefing his predecessor to hold by the service of one knight his tenure was admitted to be knight's fee and he would escape with a relief of five pounds as we saw in the case of gower but if the service due was more than that of one knight it is difficult to state with certainty what his relief would be turning to prescriptive tenure the rule seems to have been that if the predecessor in title in eleven sixty six sent in his return among the cartae baronum this was prima facie proof that the tenure was baronial footnote on the death of robert de chandos in thirteen o one his lands which were in herefordshire were found to be quote, held of the king in chief by barony by service of two knights fees end quote. calendar of inquisitions four number one five eight but the inquisition is damaged roger his son and heir seems to have disputed the tenure but without success for compertum est in rubeo libro quod inter carta stiversorum baronum annotatas ibidem continetur quidam carta ricardi de candos antecessoris praedicti rogeri de diversis feodis suis the carta will be found on pages two eighty four to five of the printed red book and records prove that the fief paid scutage on over thirteen fees in the twelfth century roger thereupon admitted baronial tenure and paid one hundred marks relief accordingly in thirteen o eight to thirteen o nine maddox baronia anglica page one two seven it was shown above that a carter of eleven sixty six in the red book was similarly relied on by the crown in the de la mare case End footnote. but the presumption so created could be rebutted as we saw in the de la mer case by proof that the service was that of one knight only footnote 
this is also the inference to be drawn from the evidence on the practice under henry the second given above End footnote. Again, as we learn from the Bramber case, the formal entry of a fief in a public record as a barony, or even as an honour, was sufficient to establish the fact that the tenure was baronial, and there is nothing to show that this evidence could be rebutted. Finally, the keen and frequent discussion as to the amount of relief payable under the second chapter of the Charter strongly confirms the main contention in this paper for the line drawn by that chapter could not be left undefined the question whether a tenure was baronial or not had to be determined before it could be known what was the relief that it was liable to pay on the other hand the line drawn in the fourteenth chapter between the greater barons and other tenants was of little or no practical consequence and could therefore be left undefined footnote the latest learning insists on the vagueness of this line. In The Origin of the English Constitution, 1912, page 227, note, Professor Adams writes, quote, As to when and where the line was drawn between the major and minor barons in either military or court service, seminary work on the available material in two different years in connection with other topics leads me to feel sure that if the statement in Pollock and Maitland 1 to 80, quote, we shall probably be nearer the truth if, in accordance with later writers, we regard the distinction as one that is gradually introduced by practice and one that has no precise theory behind it, end quote, is to be modified at all, it must be in the direction of a more unqualified statement that there was no fixed line, end quote. Mr. McKechnie, Magna Carta, 1914, page 251, similarly holds that, quote, a rough division was drawn somewhere in the midst, but the boundary was vague, and this vagueness was probably encouraged by the Crown, whose requirements might vary from time to time. The Crown tenants on one side of this fluctuating line were barones maiores, those on the other barones minores. End quote, end footnote. My reason for saying so is that the right of the lesser barons to summons to councils was not taken away by the charter, but was even asserted. Whether they looked on such attendance as a privilege, or, as is more likely at that period, a duty laid upon them, they would have no occasion, in practice, to raise the question of the line and where it should be drawn for they could attend if they wished the future developments of the principle could not then be foreseen to sum up i claim to have shown that the commentators glossing of the text by which the knights of the second chapter were made identical with the alleged lesser barons of the fourteenth creates needless difficulties and rests on no foundation footnote it is essential to keep rigidly to the actual text of the charter on pages two four eight to nine of magna carta mr mckechnie equates comites et maiores barones by earls and other greater barons where the word other is an interpolation and on page two five one quotation marks are given to minor barons a phrase which is not found in the charter End footnote the line drawn in the second chapter was in practice sharply defined because the relief payable to the crown could only be determined by it the line drawn in the fourteenth was on the contrary vague and remained in practice undefined End of section five.